When we interpret the cardiomediastinal silhouette on a chest x-ray, it can be tempting to treat the cardiomediastinal silhouette like a true silhouette, primarily focusing our assessment only on its contours and width. While the contours and width of a silhouette can sometimes allow us to infer a lot about a subject, sometimes the contours of a silhouette don't tell us very much, and we need to inspect what lies inside those boundaries to understand who or what we're dealing with. So I encourage you to treat the opacity cast by the cardiomediastinal anatomy on a chest x-ray not as a silhouette, but as a shadowgram. That means not only inspecting its contours and width, but also its texture. Recognizing when the texture of the cardiomediastinal shadowgram is abnormal can be challenging since the texture is created by a really complex superimposition of many structures of different shape, size, and density. However, in some spots, this superimposition results in recognizable sharp transitions in tissue density we refer to as lines, stripes, or interfaces. If you learn how to spot these and recognize when they're abnormally altered, you've got a handy proxy that improves your odds for identifying abnormalities in the texture of the cardiomediastinal shadowgram. A line is created on an x-ray when a very thin soft tissue plane with air on both sides is presented on edge. Be cautious when you encounter a line that's abnormally displaced. A stripe is created on an x-ray when a soft tissue plane that's thicker than a line with air on both sides is presented on edge. Be cautious when you encounter a stripe that's abnormally widened. An interface is created on an x-ray whenever two materials of different density, neither of which needs to be air, are separated by a sharp transition that's presented on edge. Be cautious whenever you encounter an interface that's either displaced or focally obscured. In summary, these are the things to try to spot when you're inspecting mediastinal lines, stripes, and interfaces on an x-ray. There will be plenty of occasions where the line, stripe, or interface you're looking for is entirely absent, meaning that you won't be able to say that it's normal or abnormal because it just isn't there. Most of the time in these kind of situations, you'll treat this as an indeterminate verdict and just move on to your next visual task. Now let's talk about the nine mediastinal lines, stripes, and interfaces you'll need to master on frontal chest x-rays. Two are lines, the anterior junction line and the posterior junction line. Two are stripes, the right paratracheal stripe and the left paratracheal stripe. And the remaining five are interfaces. The last three interfaces in this group are popularly referred to as lines, but this is a slightly unfortunate misnomer for students since radiographically speaking, they're interfaces and not lines. And that's why I'll purposely italicize the word line for these three features throughout our talk. Whenever one of these lines, stripes, or interfaces appear abnormal, it will be a flag that there could potentially be something abnormal involving either lung or pleura near the mediastinum, the middle mediastinum, the posterior mediastinum, or the left atrium in that area. Displacement of the anterior junction line or posterior junction line is a soft marker that the lung or pleural space nearby may be abnormal. It's traditionally taught that the anterior junction line um, may also be a sign for abnormal mediastinal issues and that the posterior junction line can sometimes be used as a sign for superior mediastinal issues. However, as a chest radiologist, I honestly can't think of that many episodes in the last 20 years where I or a colleague prospectively used either junction line successfully in that particular way. So there's still more of a lung or pleural marker for me. Abnormal widening of the right paratracheal stripe or left paratracheal stripe 
is a soft flag that the lung slash pleura or the medial mediastinum nearby may be abnormal. Displacement or focal obscuration of the azgosophageal recess is a soft flag that the lung slash pleura, the middle mediastinum, or the left atrium nearby may be abnormal. Displacement or focal obscuration of the AP window is a soft flag that the middle mediastinum nearby may be abnormal. Displacement or focal obscuration of the descending aorta line is a soft flag that the lung slash pleura or middle mediastinum nearby may be abnormal. And finally, displacement or focal obscuration of the right paraspinal line or left paraspinal line is a soft flag that the lung slash pleura or the posterior mediastinum nearby may be abnormal. Now, I can totally appreciate that it may be a little tough to commit this entire table to memory, so here's my chunking strategy for remembering this table. When approaching chest x-rays, I'll rely on any line, stripe, or interface as a soft flag for potential issues involving lung slash pleura near the mediastinum. That said, I'll rely on the anterior and posterior junction lines as a soft flag for potential lung slash pleural issues where the lung or pleura are mostly lucent. While I'll rely on all the stripes and interfaces to flag potential lung slash pleural issues where the involved lung or pleura is mostly opaque. When reading chest x-rays, I'll rely on any stripe or interface, but not line, as a soft flag for potential mediastinal issues. The paraspinal lines can be helpful for flagging posterior mediastinal issues, while the others can be helpful for flagging middle mediastinal issues. And for extra credit, I'll remind myself that the azgosophageal recess can also be a soft flag for left atrial issues. Now, practically speaking, the information as it appears on this table is often enough for us to make the right recommendation in terms of immediate patient management. But we should go a little deeper and understand the differential diagnoses involved. The differential diagnoses for lucent lung slash pleural disorders we're potentially flagging for include lung bully that may push either junction line away, focal lung scarring or volume loss that can tug either junction line, and a tension pneumothorax or loculated pneumothorax that may push either junction line away. The differential diagnosis for opaque medial lung slash pleural disorders we're potentially flagging for include a medial upper lung mass or an opaque space occupying upper medial pleural process, like a large or medially loculated pleural effusion or pronounced medial pleural soft tissue thickening. With regards to the differential diagnosis for middle mediastinal disorders we're potentially flagging for, a good place to start is this slide from our first year radiology resident talk about middle mediastinal disorders. The middle mediastinal disorders we're potentially flagging for include a thoracic aorta or other great vessel that's either enlarged or tortuous, a right-sided aortic arch, or mediastinal hematoma in the setting of a bleed, a hiatal hernia, dilated esophagus, esophageal mass, or large parasophageal varices, bulky lymphadenopathy, bronchopulmonary foregut malformations, and one additional item that wasn't on our original list because it wasn't a focal disorder per se, and that's excessive mediastinal fat. A few common sense reminders. If the stripe or interface is left of midline, like the left paratracheal stripe, the AP window, or descending aorta line, you can probably eliminate a right-sided aortic arch from the list. And if it's something like the AP window in particular, you can probably also eliminate esophageal disorders from the list. And the only possible enlarged great vessel in this context would be the left pulmonary artery. With regards to the differential diagnosis for posterior mediastinal disorders we're potentially flagging for, a good place to start is this slide from our first year radiology resident talk about posterior mediastinal disorders. Posterior mediastinal disorders we're potentially flagging for include bulky osteophytes from the thoracic spine, paraspinal hematomas, paraspinal abscesses, lymphoma, and neurogenic tumors. And don't forget to include excessive mediastinal fat. With the left atrium, there's basically one disorder we're potentially flagging for, and that's left atrial enlargement. For daily work, 
This is a good baseline differential diagnosis to have under your belt when you spot an abnormal mediastinal line, stripe, or interface. But this is even better. Now, let's look at how the various mediastinal lines, stripes, and interfaces appear on a chest x-ray and why they look the way they do. This is the anterior junction line. It corresponds to a line of soft tissue bordered by air in the anterior right lung and air in the anterior left lung. The anterior junction line consists of right pleura, left pleura, and a small amount of mediastinal fat. On chest x-ray, the anterior junction line will appear as a thin, relatively vertical line that projects over the expected location of the sternum that does not usually extend above the expected location of the manubrial sternal junction. It's reportedly absent in around two out of every three chest x-rays, though in my personal experience, I think it'll be absent even more often than that. When it's present and abnormally displaced, it's a soft marker for a lucent lung slash pleural disorder on either side. Here's an example where a large medial left upper lobe bulla results in pronounced rightward displacement in bowing of an anterior junction line. Here's an example where extensive fibrosis in the setting of left upper lobe non-invasive aspergillosis results in leftward displacement of an anterior junction line as it courses superiorly. And here's an example where upper right lung volume loss after right upper lobectomy results in rightward displacement of an anterior junction line. This is the posterior junction line. It corresponds to a line of soft tissue between the esophagus and spine bordered by air in the upper right lung and air in the upper left lung. The posterior junction line consists of right pleura, left pleura, and a small amount of mediastinal fat. On chest x-ray, the posterior junction line will appear as a thin line that projects over the trachea and may course as superiorly as the thoracic inlet, unlike the anterior junction line, which usually doesn't go above the expected location of the manubrial sternal junction. The posterior junction line is reportedly absent, however, in almost three quarters of chest x-rays. I honestly feel it's absent in over 95% of chest x-rays to tell the truth. Combing through my packs for examples to show, I'm lucky to encounter one in every 20 chest x-rays. When the posterior junction line is present and abnormally displaced, it's a soft marker for a lucent lung slash pleural disorders on either side. This is the right paratracheal stripe. It corresponds to a stripe of soft tissue bordered by air in the upper right lung and air in the tracheal column. The soft tissue stripe consists of pleura, the right lateral tracheal wall, and a small amount of mediastinal fat. On chest x-ray, the right paratracheal stripe will appear as a vertical stripe normally between one and four millimeters thick that extends from the thoracic inlet to the right tracheobronchial angle. Unlike the anterior and posterior junction lines, the right paratracheal stripe will be present on most chest x-rays and should therefore be a routine part of your visual search pattern. Abnormal thickening of the right paratracheal stripe is a soft marker for the presence of an opaque right-sided medial lung slash pleural disorder or a middle mediastinal disorder. Here's an example where the presence of a right-sided aortic arch between the right upper lobe and trachea results in a widened right paratracheal stripe. Here's an example where an abundance of fat between the right upper lobe and trachea in the setting of mediastinal lipomatosis results in a uniformly widened right paratracheal stripe. Here's an example where a diffusely dilated esophagus in the setting of achalasia results in a more focally widened right paratracheal stripe. 
Here's an example with the presence of several enlarged upper right paratracheal lymph nodes and a mildly tortuous brachiocephalic artery result in a widened right paratracheal stripe. While here is a common situation where the presence of mediastinal fat and a mildly tortuous brachiocephalic artery result in widening of the right paratracheal stripe. This is the left paratracheal stripe. It corresponds to a stripe of soft tissue bordered by air in the upper left lung and air in the tracheal column. The soft tissue stripe consists of pleura, the left lateral tracheal wall, left subclavian artery, and a small amount of mediastinal fat. Because it usually consists, uh, contains the left subclavian artery, the normal width of the left paratracheal stripe is substantially wider than the normal width of the right paratracheal stripe. On chest x-ray, the left paratracheal stripe will appear as a vertical stripe of variable thickness extending from the thoracic inlet to the aortic knob and usually appears substantially thicker than the right paratracheal stripe. Unlike the right paratracheal stripe, the left paratracheal stripe is reportedly absent in three quarters of chest x-rays. When the left paratracheal stripe is present and abnormally thickened, it's a soft marker for an opaque left-sided medial lung slash pleural disorder or a middle mediastinal disorder. Here's an example where bulky upper left mediastinal lymphadenopathy in the setting of lymphoma results in a widened left paratracheal stripe with a focal lateral bulge. This is the azgosophageal recess. It corresponds to an interface between air in the right lung and soft tissue in the middle mediastinum in the area where the right lower lobe invaginates into a recess bordered by esophagus and azgus vein. On chest x-ray, the boundary between the right lung and the right lateral border of the middle mediastinum near the esophagus forms a slightly concave and slightly diagonal interface that courses near midline from the subcranial region towards the diaphragmatic hiatus. This interface corresponds to the azgoesophageal recess. The azgoesophageal recess is reportedly present in around half of chest x-rays. And when it's present, displacement or focal obscuration of the azgoesophageal recess is a soft marker for an opaque right-sided medial lung slash pleural disorder, a middle mediastinal disorder, or left atrial enlargement. Here's an example where a diffusely dilated esophagus in the setting of achalasia results in rightward bulging displacement of the azigosophageal recess. This is the aortopulmonary window. It corresponds to an interface between air in the left lung and soft tissue in the middle mediastinum, where the left upper lobe invaginates into a recess between the aortic knob superiorly and the left pulmonary artery inferiorly. On chest x-ray, the boundary between the left lung and the left lateral border of the middle mediastinum between the aortic knob and left main pulmonary artery may form a concave or straight interface we'll refer to as the aortopulmonary window. Visibility of an AP window on chest x-ray is highly variable and depends on both the patient's anatomy and their positioning at the time of the chest x-ray. Displacement or focal obscuration of the AP window is a soft marker for an opaque left-sided medial lung slash pleural disorder or a middle mediastinal disorder. The AP window may normally appear either concave or straight and the AP window is considered abnormally displaced if it appears convex or becomes straight after formally being concave. Here's an example where mediastinal hematoma in the setting of a ruptured thoracic aortic dissection changes what was a concave AP window before the rupture into a straight to slightly convex one after the rupture. This is the descending aorta line. It corresponds to an interface between air in the left lung and the descending thoracic aorta.
on chest x-ray, the boundary between the left lung and the left lateral border of middle mediastinum near the descending aorta forms a relatively straight interface that extends along the length of the thoracic descending aorta and projects over the heart too. This interface corresponds to the descending aorta line. Displacement or focal obscuration of the descending aorta line is a soft marker for an opaque left-sided medial lung slash pleural disorder or a middle mesonal disorder. And in particular, aortic disorders in many cases. Here's an example where para-aortic hematoma in the setting of a ruptured thoracic aortic dissection changes what was a sharp descending aorta line before the rupture to an obscured one after the rupture. While well, here's a more prosaic example where the presence of a mildly tortuous descending thoracic aorta results in lateral displacement and convexity of the descending aorta line. This is the right paraspinal line. It corresponds to an interface between air in the right lung and soft tissue in the posterior mediastinum, soft tissue that's predominantly paraspinal fat. On chest x-ray, the boundary between the right lung and the right lateral border of the posterior mediastinum forms a relatively straight vertical interface in close approximation to the right margin of the thoracic spine. This interface corresponds to the right paraspinal line. It's reportedly absent in three quarters of chest x-rays. However, when the right paraspinal line is present, Displacement or focal obscuration of the right paraspinal line is a soft marker for an opaque right-sided medial lung slash pleural disorder or a posterior mediastinal disorder. Here's an example where markedly enlarged venous collaterals in the posterior mediastinum in the setting of central venous occlusion due to fibrosing mediastinitis result in a right paraspinal line that is focally obscured inferiorly. This is the left paraspinal line. It corresponds to an interface between air in the left lung and soft tissue in the posterior mediastinum, soft tissue that's predominantly paraspinal fat. On chest x-ray, the boundary between the left lung and the left lateral border of posterior mediastinum forms a relatively straight vertical interface in close approximation to the left margin of the thoracic spine. This interface, this interface corresponds to the left paraspinal line. It's reportedly absent in two thirds of chest x-rays. However, when it is present, displacement or focal obscuration of the left paraspinal line is a soft marker for an opaque left-sided medial lung slash pleural disorder or a posterior mediastinal disorder. Here's an example where paraspinal hematoma in the setting of a traumatic vertebral body fracture results in focal lateral displacement of the right and left paraspinal lines. While well, here is a common situation where the presence of excessive mediastinal fat results in uniform displacement of the left paraspinal line. And that's a summary of what to know and how to handle mediastinal lines, stripes, and interfaces on a frontal chest x-ray. Their interpretation is a decidedly imperfect and imprecise art, since any line, stripe, or interface may often be entirely absent on a particular chest x-ray. Even when they are present, they tend to serve as soft markers for an underlying disorder. That said, they can provide us with an opportunity to glean, to glean clues and a little more insight into the mediastinum and the lung and pleura near the mediastinum on an imaging modality that's notoriously weak in these regions compared to CT.